Hello everyone, my name is Austin Jackson and I am from Cyborg Security. And today I'm very excited to announce that we're starting a new series called Threat Hunt Deep Dives. And this is episode one, and we're gonna be talking about the XM mail server RCE, remote code execution vulnerability. This was discovered last year. And today we're gonna to get really in depth about what this exploit is and how it ticks. And we're also very excited because we're doing this video in collaboration with Scythe. Uh, Scythe is a very cool adversary emulation company and platform. You can check out everything they're doing over at www.scythe.io. And they are coming out with a blog post, which this video will be a part of. Um, and they're doing that on Berserk Bear. So Berserk Bear is this Russian state sponsored advanced persistent threat APT actor that both the CISA and FBI are doing reporting on. Um, and they are going after very strongly against uh, U.S. government networks, especially in terms of aviation, energy sector, uh, things of that nature. And they use a slew of different um, initial access vulnerabilities, one of which is this XM uh, MTA vulnerability for CVE 2019-10149. Um, they use several different other initial access vulnerabilities, and they have many TTPs associated with them. But today in this thread on Deep Dive video, we're going to get really in-depth on that particular CVE. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to take a Threat Hunt deep dive. We're really gonna do four things in this video. First, I'm gonna give you an overview and a general description of what goes into this vulnerability, how the exploit actually functions, and kind of the internals of it on a, on a sort of bird's eye view level. Um, then I'm going to actually demonstrate the technique. I'm going to emulate it on systems of my own so you can actually see how the vulnerability looks when it's conducted. Um, and then I am going to show you how to detect this vulnerability, this exploit, when it happens. I'm going to be using a Splunk instance of my own to show you how to detect this vulnerability. And then in the last part of the video, if you guys want to stick around, I'm going to, I'm going to get really nitty gritty into this vulnerability. I'm going to really take it under the microscope and show you um, some of the code, how that was fixed, and really how this exploit functions at an even lower level. Okay, so let's actually talk about this vulnerability. So this is the XM MTA RCE CVE 2019-10149 vulnerability. I know it's a mouthful, so let's break that down a little bit. Um, what XM is, is a mail server that runs on Linux and Unix, Unix-like systems. And the MTA portion of it stands for Mail Transfer Agent. And RCE is, of course, Remote Code Execution. Um, so all this together means that um, XM is one of the most popular Linux mail servers out on the public internet that a lot of people use. And this RCE means that if you know how to do this technique and the system is vulnerable to it, that you can run code on somebody's mail server as long as this vulnerability is not patched. And you may have also heard this vulnerability called the return of the wizard. And that is because there is some very um, ancient, uh, old school techniques for both um, Wiz and Debug um, in very old school mail servers that ran on Unix um, that this is kind of a callback to. Um, and also just some simple stats too uh, that we were kind of talking about earlier is that this um, XM server is just ubiquitous out on the open internet. It is on over 50% of public mail servers on the open internet run XM. And it's estimated that over 500,000 XM mail servers are currently connected to the internet. Um, and this RCE was discovered by Qualys, um, and they did a really great uh, security advisory on this vulnerability. So let's go check that out. Okay, so here I have pulled up the Qualys security advisor for this XM RCE vulnerability. And you can see they titled it the return of the wizard. And this was the initial security advisor that came out that led to the discovery and the reporting on this remote code execution vulnerability. So we can uh, just kind of skim through this and it'll give us a nice overview of what this exploit is all about. So the summary says, during code review of the latest changes in the XM mail server, we discovered an RCE vulnerability in versions 4.87 to 4.91. Um, it also says that in this particular case, the RCE means remote command execution, not remote code execution. Um, and I'm probably just going to keep calling it remote code execution because that's almost always what RCE stands for. But it effectively is the same thing um, because you're able to execute commands on the system and then later could also get remote code execution on the system if desired. Um, but it says an attacker can execute arbitrary commands with exec v as root, no memory cor corruption, no ROP is involved. So this is pretty crazy. Um, if you're able to uh, um, exploit this vulnerability on any of these versions from 4.87 to 4.91, um, you can effectively execute any command that you would want 
um, on this mail server. It goes on to say this vulnerability is exploitable instantly by a local attacker. Um, and then it says to remotely exploit this vulnerability in the default configuration, an attacker must keep a connection to the vulnerable server open for seven days uh, by transmitting one byte every few minutes. So this is pretty hilarious. Um, you know, local exploitation of, of a XML server in this case is going to be very simple, um, but remotely executing this vulnerability would require a connection to stay open for seven days, which we'll see later on. Um, it says, however, because of the extreme complexity of XM's code, we cannot guarantee that this exploitation method is unique, faster methods may exist. So there may, um, actors may be using more advanced techniques than this uh, method that takes seven days, uh, but at least this advisory is going to be talking about this seven day, one byte every few minutes. Um, I've heard it's four minutes uh, at a time sending one byte to exploit. Um, so first it's going to talk about local exploitation and um, this is kind of what it says here. Because expand string recognizes the run command args expansion item, and because new points to address is the recipient of the mail that is being delivered, a local attacker can simply send mail to something like this with the run local host, where local host is one of XM's local domains. So what this is kind of saying is that if you were to specially craft an email to local host, and this once again is a local exploitation, um, and instead of putting a person's name here in the recipient, if you kind of use this syntax and then you put a command in arguments that you wanted to run, that you're gonna be able to run any command you want on the system. That's kind of what this was talking about up here is that there's no memory corruption needed, no ROP, you can just execute commands um, by placing your commands in here where normally a recipient would go. Um, and here there's some commands being run on the system. This is what we're gonna do momentarily on a system of our own. Um, you can actually see this exploit running and actually um, I think it explains it later on, but yeah, we send more than the received headers max 30 by default and you can see all of these are received and you see it gets to 31. Um, and headers to the mail server to set process recipients to uh, this fail loop and hence execute the vulnerable code. Um, so this is actually how you get it to the portion that it needs to be to actually execute the commands that you put in the recipient. Um, once it goes over this received headers max to 31, then it will execute your um, your command via the vulnerable code. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the remote exploitation. I'm just going to kind of skim over that for now because it's a little bit more complicated and also, as you saw earlier, a little less reliable and a little finicky. Um, and also it, it's important to note because it's going to talk about non-default configurations here that this uh, exploit works out of the box with the default configuration but a lot of people are running various different configurations with the 500,000 XML servers that are on the pu public internet so every server might work a little bit differently and it might be that your default configuration uh, your non-default configuration is vulnerable or perhaps it's not vulnerable depending on um, how things are set up. So talking about the different configurations. Um, and then in here, uh, this is some some sort of funny thing if anybody's interested in kind of the history of, of exploits and bugs and things like this. Uh, the reason why it's called the Return of the Wizard, it's a reference to SinMail. Uh, it's it, their ancient whiz and debug vulnerabilities. Um, particularly, particularly, I would recommend that you read this Seclis from 1995 on the Wiz vulnerability and then this uh, um, PDF here from Cheswick on the debug vulnerability that dates back to the early 90s. Um, this link for the Qualys vulnerability and all these other links that I think are pretty cool will be down in the description. Um, but I think this gives us a pretty decent overview of the vulnerability. Um, and now I think that we're going to go and try to emulate it on a system of our own. We're going to get a XM server between version 4.87 and 4.91 and see about running this exploit ourselves. Let's go do it. Okay, so now let's go ahead and emulate this vulnerability. Um, so here I'm going to I'm going to do it locally first and then later on we can kind of test doing it remotely. But obviously since it takes a week to run one byte at a time, uh, we probably won't do the full thing. Uh, but for now, we'll just we'll emulate it locally. Um, so you can see I am on a just standard Debian Linux 10 uh, virtual machine that I have here running my environment. And I already have the um, XM server set up on the system and it is running. Um, and it's important to notice also that it's running as the user. Uh, because later on, we're gonna see that when we get remote code or remote command execution um, that 
we will actually be running as UID zero, which is with root privileges. Um, we can also see that the server is running on port 25. It's listening on SMTP. Um, so everything is set up and ready for us to go. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm pretty much gonna mimic exactly what was in that Qualys uh, security advisory that we saw earlier. So what it's gonna do is it's actually going to write a file to temp called ID. Um, so you can see right now I don't have that file. And then after we run the vulnerability, um, it'll, it'll print or it will output the command ID to that file. And instead of it being UID 1000, hopefully we'll have UID um, zero. So the easiest way to connect to our um, XM mail server that's running is just go ahead and use netcat and we can connect on port 25. Um, and the, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna identify as local host. So we can just um, say that, um, hello, we are local host. Um, and we can say that we, uh, it doesn't matter who we're gonna send this mail from, but what does matter is the recipient. So I'm just gonna copy and paste directly from that Qualys vulnerability report and we're gonna say the recipient is, <clears throat> and instead of it being a person, it is this command. And you can see that we had to use um, a lot of these escape characters. Um, this is because of some of the string formatting that goes into it. And then we're sending it on localhost as we saw in the advisory earlier. So we get a 250 accepted, which is exactly what we want. And then we need to send that data to it. And um, this is all of that um, received headers. Um, so we need to send it over 30 received headers. So I'm just going to go and copy and paste. And I'm going to send it 31 received headers and that should be it. So we get a 250 okay. Um, we can just go ahead and quit out of here. And now we can actually go ahead and look at that temp ID and we can see we get a permission denied, which is great because it means that there means that there's a file that was written to temp ID. If I run it as sudo, um, we can see that we are running as UID zero, which is root. So we just performed a um, this remote, com remote command or remote code execution vulnerability. It ran the command ID, printed it out to this file, and now we're running with root privileges. We can run whatever command we run in the system and uh, we could really wreak some havoc with this. So um, it's a really nasty vulnerability. Okay, now let's see what it would take to exploit this vulnerability remotely. And if we're going back to the Qualys security advisory that we were looking at earlier, um, we can see that there's a section talking about the non-default configurations. Um, so it kind of, uh, the default configuration, uh, thankfully comes with kind of a restrictive um, setting in it inside the ACL, the access control list. Um, but if you remove it manually, it says here, then our local exploitation method also works remotely. Um, so let's go ahead and do this. And, and I already have on that virtual machine, I went ahead and removed this access control list. Um, so we can go ahead and try this um, remotely. And what I found is that there is a nice tool on GitHub, um, directly named the CVE that we're after, um, exactly what we're trying to do. It's written in Python. Um, so somebody's already kind of done the hard work for us, which is nice and made a very nice to use command line tool. And if we look inside here, um, what this is gonna do is a little bit um, better than what our local exploitation method is, because if you read exactly what this is doing, this is actually gonna spawn a reverse shell using bin bash and pipe it over TCP on whatever port we want back to our host. And you can see here, it's actually doing almost exactly the commands that we were doing before, um, sending the, the recipient um, with the command, whatever we want the payload to be, which in this case, they've already set up the payload nice for us to connect back to our local host using a reverse shell. Um, so just a nice tight, uh, you know, less than 70 lines of code here, and we're gonna get a reverse shell back on our system. Um, so here I've already kind of uh, started uh, um, opening up some shells here to do this. So here I still have my um, Debian machine, and you can see that this is running on 192.168.69.194. And these two shells here, they are running on my actual local box. Um, so the other one is listening on 192.168.1.3. So that's my local system that I want to receive the reverse shell on. And the target is this Debian VM that's running the EXIM, um, the XM, sorry, mail server. Um, so I already got the command already kind of rigged up here. Um, and the only thing that I need to do is start a uh, netcat listener on port 9000. So go ahead and start that up on port 9000 um, because that's the port that we're specifying that we're gonna receive the reverse shell on. And you can see we've already got everything else set up. This is the target uh, remote host for our 
um, XM mail server. Uh, it's on listening on port 25, standard SMTP, and this is the local host that we're going to receive it back on. And we're already listening on port 9000. So let's go ahead and run it. So it says exploit to check your listener, and you can see that immediately the shell popped. This is very cool. Um, uh, and also you can see immediately that we're running as root, um, which is just amazing. So, um, so you can see when I run ID that we are running as UID zero, we're running as root, which is amazing. So now we can um, you know, really do whatever we want on this system. Now we've got a reverse shell established, which is very cool. Um, if we run a net stat and we check out what's happening from this dot three, um, you can see that we have this reverse shell on port 9000 established. Um, from that system, um, reverse shell back to my box here. Um, so this is a demonstration of how this could um, be executed remotely if someone had implemented bad access control list or someone is uh, doesn't really know what they're doing administering XM. Okay, so now that we've done um, both a local and remote exploitation of this vulnerability, let's talk about detecting it. So here I am inside of Splunk, um, a very standard sim. And I have some logging going on with Bro, also known now these days as Zeek. And it's probably a little bit different in your environment, but I've got an index set up for Bro, and then I've got different uh, source types for my different Bro logs. And I have a Bro source type for Bro SMTP um, entities. And um, it might be a little bit different for you. It might be Bro underscore SMTP, it might be Bro colon SMTP, colon JSON. You just have to see. Um, but what you're looking for is logs associated with SMTP, because that's going to be your simple mail transfer protocol logs. Um, and then the field that you're gonna look for, and once again, might be a little different in your environment, but in this case, it is um, RCPTTO, it's receipt or recipient two. And you can see that there's this abnormal value in here. That's what we've been seeing um, previously, is that this is the command with all of these escape characters. And in this case, um, creating that reverse shell that we saw earlier in the, um, in, when we did the remote portion. And if we actually go in here and we actually see the details inside the log, we can even find um, that field um, recipient too. And so now it's just going to um, be a matter of crafting a query that's going to find this every time directly. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and craft a query. Okay, so now I have crafted a query that is detecting this exploit being run um, quite well. Um, so you can see I still have my index and source type, but now I am filtering on the recipient too. And you can see I've um, put some wildcards in the, um, the uh, recipient two field. So it's gonna look for this sort of syntax with the run, with the curly braces around it, um, and the dollar sign in front, which is kind of like the saving to a variable. Um, and an asterisk in the middle because you don't know what command that they might put in there or what arbitrary string that they uh, might put in here. Um, as you can see here, it might be some pretty long mumbo jumbo. Um, and then on the end, we're gonna put another asterisk because we don't know what host they are um, going to put on the end of that. And I took the liberty too just to clean up the query as well so you can see it very nicely. You can see the host that it came from. You can see uh, the offending string and also how many times that it run. Um, and just to kind of, uh, you know, push, uh, put this piece a little bit more to front and center, um, we can just kind of go back and look at this security advisory. Um, just to explain it one more time, you can see it says local attacker can simply send, an, send mail to this instead of it being a regular recipient. Um, they're going to send it this kind of specially crafted syntax. So that's kind of how I'm crafting my query is that it's going to be exactly like this, but you don't know what commands they're going to put in here and you don't know what host um, they're going to execute it on. And as you can see, it's catching it um, quite well. Okay, so going back to our original game plan, um, we first did a overview of the exploit um, and then we actually um, performed the exploit. We did an emulation of it. And then I taught you guys how to detect the exploit using Splunk. And now the last part is to get into that nitty gritty of the exploit. We're gonna go a little bit deeper because this is throwing out deep dives. Um, so the last part here that I'm gonna go into is actually looking at the code that was the exact offending line of this. Um, that comes from the security advisory, but just to kind of break it down, um, here I'm looking at the XM source code, I'm in version uh, 4.9, which is one of those vulnerable versions. And so uh, we're in the deliver.c file, which is responsible for delivering messages. And this was sort of the offending block of code here. And um, uh, this is C code. And just to kind of walk you through it, 
the bad part of this was uh, this call from the expand string function. Um, so this uh, new pointing to address, this is that recipient string that was being sent. And um, what's happening here is that it's being put using a sprintf inside of this string. Now the problem is, is that expand string will recognize um, is that syntax that we've been seeing a few times now, the run command with arguments. You can see how this kind of looks similar to this local part, to this domain. Um, so if you were to um, inject what you're going to run inside this string, the expand string is going to evaluate any one of these special expansions and then act upon them. And one of the ones that it can act upon is the run command. Um, so it's an unfortunate, uh, you know, this is how bugs are, uh, you know, sometimes done in code, you know, nobody meant to do this, but you know, actions happen. Um, so now I'm actually uh, gonna walk you through how uh, this was actually accidentally uh, fixed in the source code before it was recognized as a security vulnerability. Okay, so here we are inside uh, GitHub and I'm looking at a diff um, that was made on uh, September 16, 2018. Uh, so this was for version 4.92 of um, XM. And you can see here that I'm looking at a diff um, between the changes on the deliver C uh, file and um, this particular offending code that we saw earlier with the expand string and that um, expansion, this whole block of code, the offending block of code was removed. Um, and it was actually changed, so it uh, worked a little bit differently. Um, and thankfully, it, uh, without knowing that this was a security vulnerability, it was actually removed by the authors. And then it wasn't found to actually be a security vulnerability until uh, 2019, uh, but people were still running a, a lot of the older versions of the software. Um, so pretty interesting that, uh, you know, maybe it was recognized that it wasn't that good of code, that it needed a refactor, and it did help and remove this security vulnerability before it was uh, found by Qualys. Um, so this was, this was fixed in version 4.92, so pretty interesting. All right, everybody, I just want to say thank you so much for watching our first episode of Thread Hunt Deep Dives. We're going to do a whole bunch more of these, so please subscribe to our channel if you guys are interested in this sort of content. Leave a comment, do, leave us a thumbs up. We really appreciate everybody for watching, and I will see you in the next Thread Hunt Deep Dives.